Welcome to the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast, where you get multifamily investing made real. Learn from top players in the real estate investment world as they share their secrets with you and discover proven strategies on apartment investing that actually work. To learn more about Wheelbarrow Profits, visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. Now to your hosts, Jake and Gino. Welcome to another edition of the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast. This is your host, Jake Stenziano, alongside my co-host, mentor, and guy who's fully retiring from the restaurant business this week. Congrats, Gino, the big dog, Mr. Gino Barbaro. Gino, how's it going tonight? It's been a long time coming, Jake. It's going great, actually. How many years total in the restaurant business? 20, I've owned my place 22 years. Hanging it up. Hanging up the apron. (laughs) Moving on, my friend. Here we go. Tonight, we are embarking upon our second special edition podcast entitled The Gateway into Multifamily Real Estate Investing. We're about to take a deep dive into our investment philosophy, how to pick a niche, and why we love apartment investing. So, Jake, now that you've decided to start investing in real estate, I want to ask you a question. What are your goals? Why are you investing in real estate? So, from the beginning, my goals have not changed. Uh, it was to create wealth and to create passive income. That was the; those were the goals um, going back to 2011, and those are the goals today. So the only thing that changed was our, our process and and fine tuning our systems and making uh, everything more efficient mm-hmm. and and just maximizing on the multifamily opportunities that are in front of us. Um, mm-hmm. You know, multifamily is, is obviously our niche, um, and, and specifically mom and pops, but uh, those were the goals, and we just found a vehicle to fit those. What makes our partnership a partnership, I guess you would say, in heaven is that we have similar goals. We have similar strategies. We have similar likes. We have similar dislikes, but our goals are pretty much the same, and we align ourselves the same. Jake is not a fix and flipper. Neither am I. If one of us was, it wouldn't work. That's what I want to reiterate to you guys that are on this call right now. It's really important to set your goals down. Whether you want to buy 10 units at the end of the year, 100 units, 1,000 units, get $10,000 a month in passive income, whether you want to make $100,000 a year, you need to set your goals. And I think the best thing to do is start right now and try to figure out at the end of the year, fast forward to the end of the year and to think of how the end of the year turns out for you. What would be really great? that would happen to you at the end of the year. For me, I'll give you an example. I would be financially free. I have enough passive income to be uh, living day, living my life. So I'm going to backtrack. What is that going to take me to get there? So I'm right now in February. It's I got 10 months to go until there. So I have a set in mind. I have a picture in my mind of what the end of the year is going to be for me, how it's going to be. So I already know where to start. So how do I get this passive income? For me and for our strategy, we have to buy a certain amount of apartment units. So right then and there, I know that I'm going to need to accumulate, let's say, another 100 apartment units, 150 apartment units. Whatever it is, you have to be able to chunk it down. I, I, I chose a really big goal because I'm already in the process. I've already been doing this for three years, and I see the, I see the as they say, the rainbow. I just see it so I can pick that goal and I think I can achieve that goal. But for you guys, maybe you're just jumping in right now. And if you think at the end of the year, you're going to be really successful with five units. Think of it. Think of what those five units are. Be able to touch those five units. Be able to go inside the apartment as you just turned. It smells great. You see a tenant living in there. You're collecting the cash flow. Visualize that. Make it powerful for you. Then you fast forward that to the end of the year. Let's bring it back to the beginning of the year. How many units do you need? Nail it down, five units. Notice how Gino started with a broader goal. He wanted financial freedom. And then from there, he said, what's it going to take to get there? Okay, I need another 150 units to really feel good about things. And then he starts chunking it down. You don't have to start with a a massive 300-unit complex. You may not even be able to do that. Um, but we started small. We started with a six hundred thousand uh, dollar uh, property. We didn't put six hundred thousand dollars down. We put down ten percent. The owners financed the other ten percent of the down payment. Um, but it was it was twenty five units. It, that worked for us. You don't have to start with twenty five units. You can start with ten units. But the key is you got to get started, get in the game, get your feet wet, and start learning. Educate yourself, then take action. And you know you may have to partner with somebody uh, for capital, whatever the case may be. But you got to get started with it. And Jake, what's important, what you said was really important to me is, and it really resonates with me, is 
if you pick something really big, I think it's always good to pick big goals. But if you're starting out and you pick a really big goal and you don't hit it or you get nowhere near it, you might get frustrated and you might quit. That's a great way to quit. If I had started with you three years ago and I said, Jake, by the end of the year, I want to own 300 units, you would have looked at me and said, dude, we don't even have 25 units. What are we going to do with 300 units? That probably would have really put a crimp on our plans and we probably would have failed. I think we would have failed if we, we had chosen goals that were so huge and so unattainable. But at the same time, if I had said, you know, Jake, at the end of the year, let's do 100 units. We bought 25, 75 units probably could have been attainable. Um, and fortunately enough for us, it was attainable and we did, we did hit it. But just to reiterate, don't go in all in. Like Jake said, don't think about buying that Trump Plaza when you haven't gotten your first property. Get your first property, get your deal going, get the momentum going. That's what's really important. The key to what Gino's saying is not to dismiss having big goals because I think I have very big goals, especially at this point. The, the thing is, though, I needed that little win to give me the confidence to know that I could do it, and then my goals started getting bigger and bigger and bigger because I had that little victory, and it gave me the confidence to know, wow, I can do this. And and, and I really do believe anybody can do multifamily. I say this all the time. It's not rocket science. Uh, there's people out there that um, – probably shouldn't be doing it and are still doing okay um and they just don't and it's not because they're not smart they're just they don't put in the time and they don't treat it like a business um but sometimes those little wins in the beginning can give you the confidence to catapult and, and then start saying i'm going to knock out 300 units this year i'm going to give you guys a little little tip or a little secret multifamily i think is easier than single families if you get your education you need to know what you're doing with multifamilies uh, we've got a fantastic product on how to buy multifamilies. You need to know what you're doing because it, it, it not only is it competitive, but whenever there's big money to be made, there's always a lot of people who know what they're doing. The problem with single families that I've seen and little duplexes is just so much competition at that price point. There's so many guys out there going to get those $50,000 unit apartments, $60,000. People are beating themselves up for these little properties. When you have that much competition, there's not that much margin in those deals. There's a lot of competition there. So we tend to stay away from that. We went to the 26 unit right then and there. What was great about it was a lot of guys who were into singles and multis, they don't even think they can do that. So you already lumped off a lot of the, a lot of that competition. And at a 26 to 50 to even 100 unit property, there are institutions and REITs that don't want to touch that because it's too small. So there's a certain sweet spot that me and Jake like to talk about. You know, I would say from the 25 unit all the way up to even 150 unit in, in certain areas, that's the sweet spot. Start focusing in on that. And once you get your first multi, your second multi, really continue your education. Yeah, the beautiful thing about what Gino said is that some of the sub-markets, even for 100 units or 250 units, are overlooked by the bigger institutions. So that can uh, create an opportunity for uh, the mid-level investor like ourselves where we can go in and still compete and pick up 150 units from a mom and pop or you know just someone that uh, was not running the property efficiently and there's value adds to be had there. So those opportunities are, are definitely out there. They're very real. Uh, so you just gotta you gotta really just be constantly looking, making relationships, speaking to brokers, and scouring for these deals because they're not gonna they may fall into your lap. We've actually had a few that that, that that's happened, but it was because we laid the foundation and we had the relationships uh, prior that those deals came to us. So you you gotta get out there in the beginning and really hustle, and then once you have those relationships in place, sometimes the deals will just come to you. But Jake, don't you think you have to make the commitment first? I think you have to oh, first. Oh yeah, no doubt. So no doubt. I always tell people, you know, when I'm coaching them, you know, it can't be a should. You know, I should get into real estate. It, it, I, my should was from the year 2002 to the year 2009 or 2010. I, you know, I should get into real estate more. I should invest more. And I, I really wasn't. I had a couple properties. I had a couple of properties in New York. I, I was, I would say floundering, but I wasn't doing that great. Uh, my other business was doing okay. Once 08 came, they called the Great Recession. I don't know what, what you want to call it, but it wasn't great for businesses, especially small businesses. My should became a must. So I just all of a sudden kicked it into another gear. I said, I have to do something. And that's the only way you're going to become successful in life if, if, if you decide that you have to do it. So I had to do it. So what did I do? First thing I did is I chose a niche. I said, where am I going to – what What do I want to do? How am I going to create this passive income? I don't want to fix and flip because I'm still working at my restaurant business. I don't have the time to do that. And plus, it's another job. 
It's another W-2 earning job, capital gain kind of situation. You're constantly out there sourcing deals and flipping and buying. I just didn't want to do that. I didn't see the value in that. And we had just come out of the Great Recession, so it was not the time to be doing that. That strategy didn't work in 08, 09, 010. So I, sh- I shied away from that. I-, I went into multifamily. I realized that was the place to be for what I wanted to do, for what I wanted to achieve, to achieve the financial freedom, to create that wealth and that passive income. The next step I did was I started an education program. I got coached by two different individuals. I spent a lot of money, but it was education on me. It's something that stayed with me and it really helped me. The third thing I did was I became a certified professional coach myself. I went to coaching school. I worked on a lot of personal development. You know, 80% of this stuff is psychological. 20% is mechanical. So I wanted to work on the 80% first, make sure that I wanted to do this, make sure what was holding me back. What was holding me back was fear. I didn't think I had enough money. I didn't think I had enough education. I, I didn't have the right partnerships. So that fear was whole holding me back. So when I went to do my personal development and became a professional coach, that really helped me. That gave me the impetus. Uh, I think everyone on this call, if they're serious about it, they should at least find a mentor, somebody who's willing to work with them, who's done it before, who's doing it right now. That'll be a big catalyst, a big, huge help. And then second thing, find a coach. It's always good to find a coach, to pay a coach, because when you're paying somebody, you're in. That means, you know, a mentor can give you free advice, a friend can give you advice. It's not the same thing as when you have skin in the game. It's just like an investment. When you have skin in the game, that investment, you're more aware, you're more wary, you are bought into that. So I'm a big believer of that. Once I got my education, uh, I met Jake, we partnered up, he moved down south, we started buying. It wasn't easy in the very beginning, like Jake likes to say. We were on and off for a year, year and a half. My buddy goes and buys a house. I thought he put the crimp in the deal. I'm like, this is this is a dead, dead, dead on arrival. But you know what? It really wasn't because we both really were committed to buying something. Um, and we just stuck with it. Got back together six months later. I think Jake had a, had a, had just as big as must as as I did. Um, into why he wanted to do this. That's why it didn't fizzle out. We both had that, you know, that passion into doing this and that's what kept the partnership going. And when we bought our first property, it was off to the races. Gino's being modest too, because I don't, I've been to your office before and when I've been to your house and I don't know how many books that you have in that closet, but you've read more books on real estate than I've read my entire life. And, and the cool thing is, and is that we had a little bit of a an interesting relationship because I was sort of I'm just going to jump in and do it, and I just said let's just do it. I understand, and Gino mentored me, so a lot of that information that he absorbed over those five years when he was really getting his education, uh, I was the beneficiary of because he shared it with me. So I was kind of you know the boots on the ground, just you know getting dirty, getting it done, and uh, and Gino was able to share all that education with me and uh, and mentor me as the process evolved. So you never know how the relationships, your partnerships are going to go, or who's going to add value in what way. But that's how you got to start thinking: is just how can we just get it done? If someone brings the education to the table, and someone's you know in a, in a better area, someone's willing to manage, someone's willing to put the deals together. There's so many ways to make money in real estate so you just got to keep that in mind how are you going to add value to the partnership and then just start you know getting into it take action um one of the, one of the things i wanted to touch on is that um gino what what do you say are your top three books that over those five years that really stood out to you that when you were when you're really studying hard when i think about books and real estate books i, I always go back to rich dad, poor dad, and not because of the meat and potatoes kind, but it was a paradigm shift for me because the first thing that sticks to me is it's very simple. An asset is something that puts money in your pocket and a liability is something that takes money out of your pocket. It is not rocket science. That's just a fact. Your house is not an asset unless, of course, you have a home equity line, you're using it to buy other stuff, but even so, it's taking money out of your pocket. That was huge for me. Um, his whole cash flow uh, diagram there with the four, with the business side and the investor side and the, you know self-employed employee, I was, a, I was self-employed. I was on the wrong side. And when I read the book, I was like, oh, this guy's crazy. But then you know what? It's not, it's not what you think. He's, he's right. I was, I had a job basically. I wanted to get onto the other side. I wanted to be, uh, as people say, the Mitt and Romney, fifteen percent. How do I do that? That's the system. We, I, we can't change the system. We can only you work can with adapt. The you yeah, have. that's what it is. You have to work with what system you have. When they change the tax law and they change, then you have to change with it. But I saw what real estate brought to the table as far as cost segregation, as far as tax advantages, as far as tenants paying down your debt, as far as the inflation hedge. I can go on and on about the merits of it. And that's what Rich Dad really taught me. He didn't really teach me 
how to buy like Jake and I can do. He didn't have that framework built in like we have the framework. But just that paradigm shift was so powerful for me um, as far as reading that. I've read all of his books. I, I, I've read so many other, so many books. You know, you know, Jake, I like the personal development. I like Zig Ziglar. I like Maxwell. Um, Don't for, forget your boy Fixer J. I like Jay DeSema. I mean, I like Dave Lindahl. I can go on and on. There's so many guys out there. But I think the personal development is, is powerful. Norman and Vincent Peale. You know, I like them all. They're they're all great. And then, of course, everyone knows Tony Robbins. Pick up a couple of CDs on Tony Robbins. You want to start doing some affirmations and incantations. That gets your juices flowing. It'll get you motivated. It's really powerful stuff. And I know people get upset about this when you say, look, your house is not an asset. But I just had literally about an hour ago, guys came over, my Sub-Zero crapped the bed. <laughs> and no, you think I feel like paying, fridge. No, yep. it's a $10,000 fridge. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this is great. you know. And these things keep happening. And then so you, people, if they really do the math, there's calculators that out there that will show you uh, the break-even point and when it's more um, profitable for you to rent versus own because, look, these things happen. And if you like nice stuff, it, well, okay, that's going to be another 250 bucks, And then eventually your HVAC is going to go down. And then bang, 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 and at the end of the year, yeah, you paid your principal and interest and then you're you know an extra five grand in the hole on uh, just maintenance alone for the damn thing. So anyways, I'll find a tangent on that. But one of the things that we we really wanted to share on this call was that Rich Dad was a great book because it did. It, it separated what an asset was from a liability, and it gave you the philosophical approach. Why should you be investing? Why are our assets? Why do you want to own high-value assets? And that's why Gino and I wrote Wheelbarrow Profits because Rich Dad gave you that philosophical perspective. This is why you should be investing. We wrote Wheelbarrow Profits because it gives you the, the meat and potatoes. It shows you how to do it. It shows you that three-step framework of buy right, manage right, and finance right. And we put it all out there. So that's that's why we wrote this book, and, and we really think it pairs so nicely with Rich Dad. I agree with that. The education is crucial. Um, there's so many guys out there that you can read, but I would definitely start out with Rich Dad, Poor Dad. If anyone has never done any kind of investing, at least you have to become into the investor mode. You know, like I like to say, and it's funny, we have a sign, we have a wheelbarrow as our as our, our motto, and it, you can look at it as an investment, any kind of investment. It's like a vehicle. It's getting from point A to point B. That's all an investment is. Try to choose a more efficient investment. You're going to get there quicker. With the real estate, I think you're going to get there quicker. Obviously, if you put money in the bank, you'll never get there. Mutual funds will take a lot longer. 401ks will take a lot longer. So in, real estate is just an investment that will get you from point A to point B. So I think we can all agree education is crucial. But what do you do with that education? Because there's a lot of folks out there that are getting really expensive degrees, spending hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars on college, and then they get out and they're still living with mom and dad. They're broke. Uh, it's it's You see it every day with the millennials. The key is getting education in something that you can use. And that's why we love multifamily education because you can you can get out there, get your education, but you can't sit on the sidelines. You have to then apply it and get in the game. That's why action is so crucial. Um, Gino, you want to talk a little bit about why we specifically love multifamily? Uh, sure. Well, we like multifamily. I mean, I can go through all the niches real quick, Jake. Let me just mention all the niches that, that I think sure. pertain. You know, the first one is when you're when you're really starting out, you want to wholesale properties. I was just talking to a 20 year old wholesaler. He's starting out in New York. This guy knew more about wholesaling than me, and I've been in real estate for 20 years. I had never approached wholesaling. It's a great way to get into the market if you have no money. The only problem in New York is it's very difficult in New York because you have to have a lawyer involved, draw draw paperwork. So wholesaling is a great way to get into it, but just figure out if it's okay in your market. In the New York market, it's very difficult. Um, we obviously like to buy and hold. Buy and hold is, is, I think, one of the better strategies, especially if you're trying to accumulate assets, you're trying to pay down mortgages, you're trying to create wealth. That's a fantastic strategy to buy and hold. Uh, fix and flip is a great way to start also, buy smaller properties. Um, you, you Partnership is probably good when you fix and flip, especially when you start, because you need you need to you know get capital. You need to have a couple of jobs out there going on at once, so you're going to have money, as they say, out on the street. So fix and flipping is good to get good chunks of cash, but then what we like to do is we like to throw them into the buy and holds. Uh, Jake and I had a call the other day with somebody who does turnkey rentals, and he loves single families. And Jake and I were pretty averse to single families, but we saw the merits of it. Um, single families, are they can work for people. If you like to accumulate 
and I'm not talking about getting one or two or three single families. Like in New York, if you had to buy them in New York, a single family you know, rental in New York is going to cost you $150,000, $200,000. What this gentleman was doing, he was going in Kansas City and buying them for forty five to 50000 a unit. So they were buying five, six, seven, ten single families, which is almost like buying multis. They're all around the same neighborhood. It's a great strategy because you're buying them turnkey. You're, you're, you're renting them out and you're collecting the cash flow and you're, you know, it's an appreciation play on top of that. There, they be, there's less a vacancy in there because they're a little more stable. The, the rental base is a little bit better than, than, uh, apartments, but we just think it's a little bit more of a headache because you have 10 houses scattered all around the place. Why not have two five unit complexes where you have the, all the roofs and everything on the same property? That's one of the reasons why we like multi, multi families. There's, there's, that's one of the biggest reasons. We have the economies of scale. It's better to have a 30-unit complex than to have 30, 30 single families. You have 30 boilers. You have 30 roofs, 30 grass to cut. Uh, it's just a lot of work. It's a lot of headache. And also, it does cost more to manage them. They're going to charge you more to manage uh, those single-family homes. Um, and once one of them goes vacant, there's the economies of scale. If you have three or four vacancies on a 30-family, 30 30-unit 30 property, you're going to be okay. You're still going to be cash flowing. But if you have 10, 10 singles and you have three or four vacant, it's going to put a pinch in your uh, cash flow. Yeah. So so the big thing is the, the economies of scale for sure. If you have a 50-unit complex or you have 50 single-family homes, well, you're still probably going to get banged for 8 to 10% on those single-family homes where you may be you know, 6% on the 50-unit complex for a management fee. And uh, in addition to it, you know, a couple people leave and you have vacancies in the 50 unit. Well, it's not really hurting you. You're probably still going to be, you know, at least hovering around that 95% occupancy at all times, right? Where if you have, you know, uh, somebody leave a single family home, well, that one unit itself, that's that's 100% vacant. That that hurts and that can really start to affect your cash flow quick. And it's just, uh, it's less, you know, I love using the roof example. Uh, you have them, you know, 50 units under a handful of roofs versus 50 roofs out there. Um, you know, and then, then it all just kind of compounds from there. Then there's more gutter, there's more everything. So it's, it's combining things and making it more efficient. Uh, and I think it makes it safer personally. I've seen a lot of markets. Um, this might be my assumption, but I, I think a lot of markets, multifamilies work a lot easier than single families. That's just from what I'm looking at. Even in New York, if I was to go into the multifamily business, I could probably make more money doing multifamilies in New York than I can with singles in New York in certain areas because the per unit costs are also cheaper mm-hmm. from buying a multifamily property. You can buy maybe a fiveplex, let's say it's fifty thousand a unit here, but a single family is going to cost you seventy, eighty thousand a unit, and and the rents are not that much. They're not that much different the rents to be honest with you. I mean, let's say a, a you know three bedroom house here, you could rent it for you know fifteen hundred dollars. A three bedroom apartment, you could probably get eleven or twelve hundred dollars with no problem here. So um, you know that's that's one of the things that I'm, I'm seeing. Also, when you have all these singles all over the place, insurance costs are more money because each house has to be insured. You have property taxes on every single one of these. So there's a I think the costs are higher to run all these singles, don't you, Jake? I do, and the beautiful thing is it just depends how you run your business because if, if you're going to self-manage and you want to hire employees, uh, it's you buy a bigger complex, you're going to be able to do that a lot easier than if you have maintenance guys running all over town, burning up their gas. Um, it's, that's going to be much uh, more challenging than if you have uh, a single parcel where you have 50 to 100 units or even a 25-unit complex for that matter. It just I, it just makes things a lot easier from a management perspective as well. I think you hit the nail on the head right there. It's you know I, I don't want to say this, but it's either you want to be a landlord or you want to be an asset manager. When we first started out, we wanted to be landlords, I think. I don't think Jake and I expected us to grow the business this quickly and to have this many tenants and to have this many properties. But you know what? I, I think we just fooled ourselves and all of a sudden we started growing and then you get out of that landlord mentality where I'm, 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 I have to run and do the cut the grass here and change this plumbing fixture and uh, you know like everyone likes to I say I was thinking about cutting the grass in the beginning just because I love it but just, I, I know, just well, so you know. Yeah. but let me tell you though isn't that funny if you have 10 single family homes and you're cutting the grass on all those how long is that how much time is that going to take out of your you life you it's can't gonna, you just can't do you, well it. you know people do that though there's a lot of people who do that and you know what that's their business their business they're maybe contractors construction guys and that's what they think they have to do so they focus on that and they lose sight of the huge big picture where you know what instead of buying more deals getting into more deals growing their portfolio where they should be you know actually focusing on they're focusing on cutting the grass and changing a hot water heater and that's I don't think it may be in the beginning when you first start out you want to get your hands dirty you want you know you want to save a few bucks but as you're growing you're going to say to yourself well I have to start 
you know, growing my business. I have to figure out what I got to do here. And that's where I think multifamilies will allow you to scale up and to start doing that. Because when you do have 50 units under management, you can get one guy to come cut the grass once a week. You can have one maintenance guy on staff to take care of the entire property. You can have a resident manager living there helping you out. And it'll free you up to do whatever you're doing. And Hope you to- get your next deal. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. I totally agree with that. And and to your point, you, you, know, you were talking about we didn't think we were going to get this big this quick. And that's why I think it's so important to get in the game because we got started, we, we bought right, and therefore we started getting our confidence up and we said, we can do this. We can compete and we can do we can do really well here. So that's why I just keep going back to it. Get in, find a deal to get into that makes sense, that you can buy right, and and then you're off to the races because you're going to start getting credibility. You're going to start uh, networking with more people. You're going to start building your team, and it's all going to start snowballing from there. But if, if you get your education and you don't, pursue it and you don't take action and get in that first deal, then you, you, you're going to be stuck on the sidelines. It's funny. I like what Jake says here. He says, uh, so how do you choose a niche? He, he, this all depends on your goals and situation, basically. If, if your goal is to make 50000 bucks a year on a few flips and play video games the rest of your time, there's nothing wrong with that. It's all about creating the life that you desire. So that's great. That's clarity. If that's what you want to do, there's nothing wrong with that. That's there's great. There's people that do that. Yeah, I've met people that, yeah. that are doing a few deals a year and then they, they hang out and play uh, – What's the what's the modern warfare? That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> there's nothing wrong with it. That's if that's a lifestyle you want, that's awesome. At least you know that. If you ask somebody what they want, they'll tell you what they don't want. So if you know you want to play video games and make just enough money, there's nothing wrong with that. Then that's how you choose your niche. But if you want to really create wealth, make generational wealth, have a lifestyle where you can spend time with your family, choose when you want to work, I think multis is, is the way to go. I just get jacked up doing deals. I love it. <laughs> you know, I just yeah, want to well, I get bored if becomes, I'm sitting on the sidelines it, for a while, right? Yeah, it becomes um, it becomes really, really addicting because you're putting something together, you're creating something, you're putting a deal together, you're buying something at a great price, so you may be able to you know make money on it. That's what I think started juicing us up and started letting letting us look at bigger deals, and we're like, wow, this is awesome. I don't know any other way to explain it other than that. If I go four to six months without doing a deal, and I don't know that I have in the last three years, I start feeling like a loser. <laughs> I just think, well, I don't you know, know what, what it is. I'm just like, is, man, Jake? we got we got to buy something. I start freaking out. I think I get bored. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, we were doing that last night. I was talking about make. We're not even I closing. Know. We're closed on, and I'm already looking forward. And that's you know part of what you want to have in your life is you don't want to be complacent and say though I'm, I'm satisfied. But at the same time, I think me and Jake have to you know slow down sometimes and smell the roses because we've accomplished a lot. But that's not in his DNA, and it's not in my DNA either. But I think sometimes when you accomplish something, you really have to appreciate what you did. Um, don't take it for granted because it's not easy it's a big accomplishment but at the same time you always have to be looking forward and and just pushing forward so getting back to sort of we were talking about uh the the value that we see in multifamily and then you know here's the the big picture too you're you're buying this you know you're putting you know 10 to 20 percent down on a deal depending on how you structure it uh 20 percent in a lot of cases and then you're using the bank's money for the rest of it then your tenants are paying down that mortgage right so there's the wealth accumulation portion of it you're getting cash flow every month you're positively cash flowing on it you're creating wealth the thing is that's why we love these right but the key to it is getting started and buying right initially. So what we were able to do is we went outside about 30 minutes outside of the metro, uh, at least the downtown area of our market, and we found that some of the submarkets were in blue-collar uh, areas. There's a lot of good blue-collar workers, retail workers, and we we're finding that the units were trading almost half of what they were uh, closer to downtown, and the rents were not that much different. So sometimes starting in a submarket can be a huge advantage in, in picking that right submarket that has the kind of tenant you're looking for. We're looking for blue collar uh, tenants, uh, also that worked retail jobs. Um, you know the, the 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 what do you say, fifteen to twenty five dollar an hour or ten to twenty five dollar an hour crowd, right? Yes. So those submarkets can create a real good opportunity for you in the beginning when you're when you're selecting the market. And we did it, you know, it was close to where I live, so I was able to check up on it quite often and uh, and that worked for us, but there's a million ways to do it. Well, I'll give you another example. I'm gonna throw something out there and some people are gonna think I'm crazy. Some people never think that they've never thought about it before. But if you're in a situation and you're not happy where you're living, why don't you think about moving? Uh, Jake did. Um, and don't tell me about family because I've got six kids. I've I'm transplanted here. I am a pillar of the, uh, you know, uh, I'm a pillar of, 
how do you say that, Jake? I'm a pillar of um, you are of a staple a, in the community. Everybody I'm, loves I'm, them, Gino. <laughs> okay, let me say, I'm a pillar of the community, and you know what? I, my whole family's here. I've lived here my whole life, but I just said to myself, if I want to continue to invest and I want to continue to control my destiny, let me choose a market that works. So I did what Jake did. I looked at a place that had low taxes, that had great quality of life, that had you know something quality of life where you can actually afford and what i'm doing is i'm picking up and i'm moving to jacksonville florida um, it's under it's underneath the radar what we were talking about it's it's not bid up by the institutions yet there's still a value there there's enough big assets where we can make we can make you know a little rumbling there we can buy a few assets in the beginning but you know what guys think about that if you're living in a market where you can't buy real estate if you're living on the east coast or the west coast california new york new jersey even parts of connecticut where you just can't afford it try to move out i mean in connecticut you can go in, in, into the northern parts of Connecticut might be a little bit cheaper. Same thing in New York. If you want to be a hands-on person, especially in the beginning, move somewhere. Go find a market where you, th- where you think you're going to really like to live. If you're a skier, go to Colorado, although Colorado is really expensive now. I got guys in Colorado that are going to be going down to Florida. So choose a market that you think you can afford. Do research in that market. Go buy a house or go rent an apartment. We're going to rent for a year. If I don't like it, my kids don't like it, I can always come back to New York. But I think we're going to like it. There's no state income tax down there. Uh, it's so much cheaper to live down there than it is in New York, and um, the market is great for for investing. So think think outside the box. We're always programmed to saying, "I can never do that." What are you kidding me? And you know what? I've got to sell a house. It's is it easy? It is not easy. It's the toughest thing in the world. But you know what? To grow in life, if you're going to stagnate and keep doing the same thing, you're going to get bored, and you're going to get bored. You're going to feel unfulfilled. So to feel fulfilled in life, you have to push yourself. You have to become uncomfortable, as I like to say. And I've been uncomfortable the last couple of months. And you know what? I'm growing. The opportunities are coming my way. I don't know how to deal with them. I'm just figuring it out as it goes, but I'm not going to make that an excuse. I'm going to push forward. I'm, I'm going to another market. So, um, you know, think about that. Think about moving to another market. And if you don't want to move in another market, learn how to invest in that market. We've got programs to show you how to go into another market, how to do your research in a market, how to choose a market. Uh, it's not that difficult. All the institutions do it. You can find people to do it for you. Um, I would really highly recommend that. So many people that I've talked about my story with, and I suggest, well, you could do the same thing. Oh, no, I couldn't. I could never do that. I got what this. I got it? that. What do you huh? call it? What's call that? what? What's that? What's Self-limiting that? beliefs up the right. wazoo. And, and there's so many people that I talk to. Oh, I can't do it because of this. I can't do it because of that. Well, my situation was no different. Why could I do it? Am I special? No. I just said, screw it. I'm out. I'm, not, I'm, I'm getting out of this crap. I want a better weather. I, I was sick of turning all my money over. To New York State and uh, said, see ya. So, but you always, what I like to tell people, Jake, is you make a list of pros and cons. You make a pro and con. So, in your situation, your pro was you were leaving a market here that you know you couldn't afford. You were going down to warmer weather. You were going down to a better market, right? You were going down to a better quality of life, better tax situation. Those are I'm just listing out the pros for you. And the cons for you was you leaving your family, right? Uh, you leaving the comfort. You leaving the, a job that you had but here. But now they're saying, hey, I think this kid's onto something. They're starting. They're trying to get out of there now too. So. You know. And that's what's happening. So then yeah. I, I tell everyone here on this call, make a list of pros and cons. Just evaluate your life uh, and see where you are in life. And if it's a place where you're like, you know what, I think it's a good idea, then then take the chance. Because you can always come back up. Jake, you can always sell the house and come back up to New York if you want. Um, if you've done it the first couple of years, if your wife didn't like it. I know you guys could have sold and come back up. So, you know, it's something where you take a shot. And it's funny, now that you say that, you're the first one. And I have a feeling that's what's going to happen with me. I think the floodgates are going to open. You have to have the first – I'm not – I wouldn't call myself brave. I have just call myself fed up. <laughs> so yeah. it's another one of those musts. No, it's but there's nothing special story. about it though. It's just no. – it's stop. It's stop you know, with the self-limiting beliefs and just saying to yourself, I can't, I can't. Well, yes, you can if you want to. You know, you have to decide and get over that and, and just do it. Um, and what, you know, what's a relief for me, Jake? The relief for me is that nobody's telling me that I'm crazy. I have not had one person say to me, what are you, crazy? So I know in my heart of hearts that that's the right decision for me. So everyone on this call, they have to make the decision for yourselves. You don't have to listen to other people. It's always good to get advice from other people, obviously. But I haven't had one person say, even with my large family and my situation, the business and being in the community and doing all that, they haven't. They said, I completely understand why you're doing it. So um, to everybody out there in real estate, if you want to go search these markets, they're there. There's markets we can name off five or six right off the bat to you. Look at anywhere in Texas. Look at Kansas City. Look down in Florida. All these markets, they're still emerging. And, you know, it's very – real estate is very cyclical, so it's really market-specific. So go and, and, and see where you like to live and then see if that market's doing well in real estate and pair it up. 
Yeah, but I think to to start to you know pull all this together, the 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 reason we did this call is because you need to figure out what your goals are, and your goals may not be the same as ours, and and that's fine. Everyone's got different goals, but when you understand what your goals are, and if and if real estate fits into those goals, then you got to keep chunking it down and say what niche am I going to invest in and why, and make sure that niche aligns with your goals. Become an expert, get a crystal clear target. And then get, take that laser focus and get your education and then take action and start to execute. Pick one of those goals and then just drive it. It's, it's really doable. You just have to commit to it. Jake, let me give you an example. I've got a student that I'm working with right now. Um, great guy, young guy. He's got a sharp mind, but I see he's going in 15 different directions. He's got a spec house. He's got um, a job. He owns a couple rentals. I mean, he's great. He's a really smart guy. And he just needs some guidance and some direction. Uh, listening to this call would probably help him because he, like you said, he has to really become target specific. He he has to get some coaching. And I mean, I would wrap it into even some life coaching where what do I want to do? What do I want to achieve? You want to create like a meta plan. A meta plan is a holistic, all encompassing plan of what you want to get out of life. And Jake likes to talk about the five F's. I mean, I can, he can go over the five F's. I think it's really important to have goals, not only monetary goals, but you know, financial goals, but you want to have family goals. You know, you want to fitness goals. You want to have all those goals and wrap them up and see how they can blend in your life. It is a balance, though, because it, it's hard when you get as busy as as, as we all do. Um, and and Gino's talking about the five Fs, but it's 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 faith, family, financial, fitness, and friends. And um, and it's hard to keep all those balls juggling at, at the same time. But yeah, I've been really um, really focusing in on this over the last few months and trying to allocate enough time to each one to really maximize the the life that I want and and that's important to me. Maybe, you know, some people say, "Well, I'm not concerned with fitness or I'm not concerned with my friends or whatever." So you, you can chunk it down, but for me the the 5 Fs really fits my lifestyle and and my goals. Gino, great information tonight. And to the folks out there, we hope you've enjoyed the special edition of the Wheelbarrow Profits podcast. Check us out next time when we take a deep dive into creating a credibility book and exactly what you need to get into your first deal. We trust that you enjoy the Wheelbarrow Profits Podcast. Visit jakeandgino.com, your one-stop shop for everything multifamily. See you next time when Jake and Gino share more of their investing secrets with you.